Hi there, everyone. Um, my name is Mark Blackster. I'm speaking to you from the Tree of Life program at the Sanger Institute um, in Cambridge. Um, Tree of Life is part of the Earth Biogenome Project, and it's really great to be able to present some of our work to you um, in Biodiversity Genomics 2022. Um, what we hope to do is kind of embodied by this picture, which is a planet being eaten away by humans, but actually being sustained by the biodiversity of the ecosystems that uh, create the biosphere of the planet. And what we hope by our work at the Tree of Life program in Cambridge is to supply reference genomes that will be of utility to people who are wanting to monitor um, biodiversity loss, monitor biodiversity uh, repair, take part in conservation genetics programs, but also to use these as raw data for, for example, new bio industries, new feedstocks, new uh, sources of drugs um, to keep the human population healthy. We're also obviously, because we're scientists, very interested in the biology we can do with these genomes. So what I'm gonna do in this talk is just take you through what we're doing at Tree of Life at Sanger, where we've got to so far in our major project, and then talk to you about one small piece of biology we've been able to do with these new high quality reference genomes we're generating. So 250 years ago, Carl Linnaeus introduced the Linnaean system for describing life on this planet. And this lingua franca, this universal language, now allows us to talk about all the species on the planet, uh, wherever we are and whoever we are, and what our, whatever our native human language is. And the land system is really successful. We have named about 1.8 million eukaryotic species. And I regard this as the catalogue to the Library of Life, the catalogue of the books of the Library of Life. But it is only a catalogue. It links to lots of biological data, but what I would like to do from a genomics point of view, along with many others, is actually print out or make available online digitally, if we print them, that's the end of the forests of the planet, is print out and make available the actual content of this library. So you'd be able to go to the library and you'd be able to take out the book about the species you're interested in. Here I've highlighted Melis Melis, the Euro European badger, which appears in Carl Linnaeus's first catalogue. And we've now sequenced the European badger. And you can download this genome freely from the public databases, from the INSDC consortium. And you can get this whole genome. And this whole genome is now there for you and anybody else to work on, to understand the evolution of carnivores, to understand the evolution of social behavior inside badgers, to track badger population change and movement, and maybe to start understanding badger immunity because badgers are of a concern in agricultural ecosystems because they're a host for bovine tuberculosis. So what we want to do is generate the text for the books in the Library of Life. There are about 1.8 million eukaryotic species. It's a major job. And we're working with other people across the world to try and realize the goal of sequencing all 1.8 million species of eukaryote. So that's why I call my talk Sequence Everything. We aren't actually sequence every sequencing everything and we don't know what everything is, but that is our goal. That is our, truly our goal is to generate genomic sequence for every species on this planet. This is the stated goal of the Earth Biogenome Project and our projects that we're involved in are a, a component of that. Tree of Life is involved in several major projects. Our biggest one is the Darwin Tree of Life project, and that's what I'll spend most of time on today. And there we hope to sequence the majority of the 70,000 or so species that live in and on and around the islands of Britain and Ireland. So this is an archipelago off the west coast of Europe. And we're well into phase one, and we're planning and have some funding for phase two, so that's 20,000 species. We also have a project called the Aquatic Symbiosis Genomics Project, which is global, sequencing about 500 symbiotic systems to identify the genomes of hosts and symbionts. These are from marine and freshwater. And then we also are partners in the Vertebrate Genomes Project, European Reference Genome Atlas, and of course the Earth Biogenome Project. So all of these projects, our aim is to generate high quality, telomere to telomere, if you like, 
but chromosomally complete reference genomes for species, whether they be protists, fungi, plants, or animals. The first thing in, we've done in all these projects is to coordinate. And one of the things we realize is that while we have a list of all the species, what we didn't have was a way of making sure that we didn't sequence things twice or making sure that our projects were synergistic. So we've um, generated at the Sanger Institute a system called Genomes on a Tree. And there's the, the web link. Genomes on a Tree is a database about species. And the about bit mostly concerns genomics. So how big is the genome? How many chromosomes does it have, etc. What it also collates is any activity on genomics on those species. And so we can use these data to coordinate our species. So we can share active uh, lists of species we're actively working on. We can share lists of species we'd like to work on but haven't collected yet. This will, we hope, promote collaboration. For example, you'll sequence species A and I'll sequence its sister species B. And that means that together we have a much richer data set. And it also allows us to display publicly um, our progress and our success. So to say to people how we're doing. So the graph here is a summary pro actually built in side goat of the genomes from Darwin Tree of Life that are available in INSDC, showing that most of them, the purple dots, which are our, our reference genomes, meet the EBP metrics of contiguity and uh, scaffold length. The ones that don't actually are from species which have chromosomes that are too small, for example, to meet the contig or scaffold N50. Uh, criteria. So they're actually still within the EVP metrics. Okay, so the first thing was coordinate. The other thing we've done is built a consortium, a collaboration across lots of institutes. So the Sanger Institute, where I work, is a genomics institute. We're not a biodiversity institute. And so it's essential for us to work with people who are biodiversity partners. And so, for example, we work with the Natural History Museum, the Botanic Gardens at Kew in Edinburgh, and the Marine Biological Association. Excitingly, we also work with the University of Oxford's Wythe and Woods uh, Genomic Observatory site, and many, many of the species we are sequencing, the samples, the specimens, are taken from this one site, which is a, an ancient oak wood, ancient deciduous forest in the, the south of England. And the idea is that this allows us to integrate these genomes in an ecosystem context. We do sequencing and analysis, and we're helped in the analysis by partners such as the Earlham Institute, Embley BI, Cambridge, and Edinburgh. Over the last three years, we've built what we call the genome engine. This is a process that takes samples from the wild, follow, associated with all the metadata that's needed to identify them. We identify them, we DNA barcode them, we ship them to the Sanger Institute, we extract their DNA and RNA, and we generate sequence data. We use PacBio HiFi and Illumina HiC data to do the assembly. Um, this, in our hands, gives the best assemblies for the um, and most efficient way. We also generate RNA-seq data, and this is not to map patterns of gene expression, but just to find the genes so that when we, we can do the um, annotation. We then do an assembly. We scaffold that assembly with high C, and then the assembly, and very importantly, goes to curation, which is a series of skilled interventions by skilled staff who turn the scaffolded assembly into a chromosomal assembly, and that is then immediately submitted to ENA. We don't place embargo on our assemblies. From ENA, which is part of the INSDC collaboration, and therefore the data goes into GenBank and TDBJ. From ENA, the data are picked up by Ensemble, and the Ensemble team do the annotation and present the annotation results openly in the Ensemble portal. And we then publish the genome as what we call a genome note, a short paper that just says, here's the genome, here's who helped do it from the collector, to the assembler, and please do use it. That's the main message of the genome note. So it's a short paper that just describes the genome. So this has now been running for three years. Um, it works, and it works at scale. Currently in the Sanger Institute's freezers, from a total of 155 submissions of, of uh, shippings to us, we have 19,000 samples, which come from 9,000 specimens, because specimens are cut up into smaller pieces to be frozen. And those 9,000 specimens come from about 3,500 species. So 3,500 species of eukaryote from protist via plants and fungi 
in animals. And we can generate really good assemblies. This is an example from a moth where um, we had sufficient high phi data, the long read pack bio data, and sufficient high C data to do an automated assembly, which only took a very few hours. And I hope you can see from this high C plot that the primary assembly that we generated before curation is of very high quality. There are 31 squares there on the high C plot. That's 31 chromosomes. And the value, the quality values of this genome are very high. So we believe we can work at some speed. And currently, we're putting about 50 species into sequencing every week. So that's extracting 50 species a week. And these, some take longer, some take short amounts of time, will then appear in the public databases for everybody to use. So turns out Lepidoptera are quite easy. So that lilac beauty moth is actually quite an easy genome to sequence. It has low level of repeats. The chromosomes are um, relatively easy to assemble and the high C data look really nice. So we've been challenging ourselves with slightly more difficult genomes. And one question we're asked is, yes, it's easy to sequence half a gigabase moth genome, but what about plants? What about the big plants? What about the plants with giant genomes, which are full of repeats and uh, retrotransposons and maybe polyploid? So we challenged ourselves, along with our colleagues in Edinburgh, to sequence the genome of mistletoe. So mistletoe is a, a parasitic plant, and it has one of the largest genomes known. So the genome has been estimated at between about 90 and 100 gigabases. That's 30 times the human genome. Uh, different individuals have different sized genomes, which is interesting in itself. Um, and we sequenced an individual which has an estimated genome size of 93 gigabases. We generated 25 fold coverage of the genome in hi fi data. This is over 100 packed bio flow cells, and 25x is our normal level of sequencing for genome assembly. We also generated hi C data to about 50 fold coverage. Again, this is our normal level of hi C da data generation. And did it work? Well, obviously, I'm telling you about it, so it did, but um, it astonishingly worked. So this is a high C plot. The colors are different from the previous one, but um, it basically shows you in the diagonal, these are the scaffolds generated by the uh, YAS scaffolder from the primary uh, assembly contigs from all of the data. So, just remind you, this square here is plotting 30 human genomes worth of data. So it's 100 gigabases across um, left, right, and up and down. And each one of those crosses you see on, the, on this map is a chromosome. So each of the chromosomes of this species is about three times the size of a human genome. That's what the three pink dashes are. So the preliminary scaffolding gave us a scaffold N50 of 6.4 gigabases, which was approximately a chromosome arm. And with very simple curation, this has been turned into a chromosomal assembly. So we can do giant genomes. We're now unscared by the size of the genome we have to sequence. It just means more data. There may still be challenges for things like complex polyploid genomes, but those are being solved um, elsewhere in the world. And we're can convinced and uh, satisfied that we'll be able to do them as well. So there you go, we can do giant genomes. I'd also mention that mistletoe is actually a giant organism. Most organisms on the planet are actually tiny. So most protists obviously are single cells, uh, but most fungi, we will find them as uh, small amounts of hyphae. And in fact, most animals are very small. Most animals are less than five millimeters in size. And this means there's a very limited amount of DNA in each of those organisms. So is it possible to sequence genomes from very small organisms? And this is a problem because most of the technologies we have require something like, well, they'd like to have micrograms of DNA, but the minimum input at the moment is about 20 nanograms of DNA. So can we sequence the very small, and the very small that has tiny amount of DNA? So uh, one of my, the loves of my life are nematodes. Uh, nematodes are wonderfully diverse. Um, many of them are parasites, which is interesting in itself, but most of them are free living. 
And our current genomic uh, data for free living nematodes is woefully inadequate. We have a beautiful genome for Cinerabditis elegans and some other free living nematodes we can grow in culture. But for the mass, vast majority of free living nematodes, we have no data. And these are really important organisms in uh, benthic ecosystems. Numerically, they're probably the most abundant organism on the planet. We can have discussions about whether ants beat them. But they're very small and they have very few cells. So uh, nematodes have determinate development and so have actually a limited number of cells in each adult animal. So approximately 1,000 to 2,000 cells. Their genomes are relatively small as well, approximately 100 to 500 megabases. And so this means each individual animal can only contain a tiny mass of DNA, much less than an anagram. What we know is that if we sequence bulk samples of organisms like this, we don't get good assemblies. And that's because they are so um, genetically diverse, there's so much sequence variation between them, that they just don't assemble well. We're trying to assemble 20 or 40 or 100 haplotypes at once, and the assembly graphs just don't resolve. So can we sequence single nematode organisms and single myofaunal organisms, single small organisms at all? So we've been uh, lucky to work with uh, Dr. Chris Lomer, who works at the Natural History Museum in the UK, um, who has been developing for some years now a picomolar input multimodal sequencing method. This is ultra low input. Chris designed it to work on his favorite uh, myofaunal flatworms which have an abundance of cells, sometimes up to about 5,000. But he's worked with us to get it working on nematodes and work it does. The process involves extracting the RNA first and then taking the DNA from a single organism through a long range PCR with a carefully controlled number of cycles to generate a sequencing library which is representative of the original genome. And this works. So. This is a set of data from uh, Dr. Anna King in my group, who's been sequencing uh, marine nematodes from the North Sea. And the um, x-axis is the N50 of the assembly she has from these individual nematodes. And the y-axis is the BUSCO completeness, an estimate of the genetic completeness of these species. I should say that BUSCO completeness in nematodes is always interesting. The BUSCO set doesn't actually fully represent um, the diversity. But you can see she can get up to 600 kilobase N50s from single nematode specimens. Um, um, there are some that don't work, and we don't know why. Um, there are some fails, but in general, we're getting really good assemblies from these single nematodes. And as we refine the method, we'll get better and better. What's even more exciting is that Erna can then take bulk high C, so the high C from, let's say, 20 or 30 individual nematodes of the same species, and use that to scaffold the genome. So go from this initial contig assembly, we can use other specimens where, the, where we're not so concerned about the genomic diversity and do an assembly and a scaffolding to get to chromosomes. And so here is the first chromosomal assembly of a free living marine nematode generated from a single specimen. Um, so Adonkalamus is a relatively common nematode. Um, so, uh, Erna was able to pick uh, 22 individuals she was pretty sure were of the same species, but we think this method should be applicable to any sample where you can pick morphotypes and pull the morphotypes to do high C. So we can generate the very biggest genomes with a bit of effort, and we can generate genomes from the very smallest organisms with a bit of effort. So we think everything is accessible to us. And that's not just in Britain and Ireland for the DTOL project, that's across the world. So everything we think is accessible. There will be problems. There will be organisms where the DNA doesn't extract well. And there are problems with protists where sequencing a good genome from a single cell is still a challenge. But there are many, many very good people working on that now. What we realize is when we're sequencing these organisms from the wild, they're often infected or carry other organisms on them. So this is a moth, Phalera bucephala, the buff tip moth, which happens to be in, have been infected by three different strains of Wolbachia. Wolbachia is an alpha proteobacterium, very common in insects. About 40% of insect species are infected, and it's a re reproductive manipulator, the, the Wolbachia is. Um, 
so it, it fiddles with the reproductive biology of its hosts. And so this infection is important to know about. And what Emily Vancaster and others found here was this moth genome, which assembled beautifully, was accompanied by three one and a half megabase Wolbachia genomes. So we got four genomes for the price of one. And so Emmeline has been chasing this idea across all the genomes we sequence in the Darwin Tree of Life and elsewhere, and is able to assemble many, many cobion genomes. So we can't say whether they're parasites or pathogens or just happen to be there. And they're not really the microbiome as in the gut microbiome. We often don't sequence to enough depth to find that, but definitely we can find pathogens and parasites. And so, for example, Emmeline has assembled 110 Wolbachia genomes from various insects and um, others that the Darwin Tree of Life has project, project has, has generated the reference genomes for. Um, these include 77 genomes where they are actually in perfect circles. So the full genome has been assembled. And this, this graph shows the relationship between the host phylogeny and the Wolbachia phylogeny. And as expected, there is little correlation between these two. We know that the Wolbachia jumps between hosts quite frequently. But this gives you a sudden new view on how pro, uh, prokaryotes, in this case, associate with eukaryote hosts. And this can be applied to finding and discovering the genomes of parasites within hosts, um, as well as some of the other cobiome. This is really important for us inside Darwin Tree of Life because we're running this aquatic symbiosis genomics project. In this project, we are not sequencing in general the separated hosts and symbionts. We're actually sequencing them together. So we're taking a uh, holobiont, so the total symbiont, sequencing it in one go and hoping to extract the genomes of both the usually you get well the eukaryotic host and its prokaryotic or other eukaryotic microbe symbionts. And this is not a simple job. So this is, these are two blob plots. So blob plots are where we show along one axis the GC content of a contig. And on the Y axis, we show the coverage of that contig by reads in our data set. So the coverage is a proxy for the molarity of that sequence in the mix. And one would expect that all the genome, all the bits of the genome of one organism would have the same molarity, barring sex chromosomes. All, every one of our chromosomes is in the same concentration, if you like, inside us. The genomes of other organisms, the cobionts, wouldn't necessarily have the same molarity, and so would appear at different coverages in the data set. So we can use that as a way of separating the genomes. We also know that uh, often bacterial genomes have a very um, concerted and, and uh, similar GC content right across the genome, as do most eukaryotes. And so we can actually separate different genomes out on the x-axis here by GC content. So the, the graph on the left is for the total data set. This is a primary assembly. And you can see it's, it's an entertaining splash of color, um, almost uninterpretable. But actually hidden in there, are, it's a relatively uh, complex but separable set of organisms. So the, the one on the right shows just the sponge data, which has um, relatively low GC and a mid-range coverage of something like 60x in this data set. And then also on that graph in the, the green splodges and dots are four independent genomes of uh, bacteria in the group uh, Gematomonadetes, and we can assemble those separately. So we can actually pull all the cobionts out of these symbiont systems. This is really exciting. So we can we can start looking at these symbiont systems from nature without having to very cleverly, separately cultivate, we hope, separate organisms. OK, so overall, this is where we are to date. This is our progress. Currently in the lab at Sanger, we're working on about 2,500 different species from 806 different families. These include protists, plants, fungi, and animals. As you'll see from the tree on this graph, this tree is of just the families, not the species. Um, there is a slight bias towards metazoan families. That's because there are more families of metazoa, um, especially in Britain, Ireland. But we are sequencing across diversity of the other groups as well. The histogram on the outside of this 
uh, tree shows you the number of species we've sequenced for each family. And while in general we're going for one or two, in some groups we have sequenced more, partly because they're easy to collect and partly because we also wanted to dive more deeply into the genomic biology of some groups to demonstrate the utility of these genome sequences. So at the moment we have submitted 500 reference genomes to the public databases. This is, a, a, I think, an amazing achievement for the team at, at Tree of Life and Darwin Tree of Life project. Um, and that's the product of our first three years of work. Um, we hope to reach uh, 2,000 gen genomes early next year and to do two to 3,000 genomes a year thereafter. I mentioned that we're publishing these genomes. We publish them as genome notes. These are short articles which just describe the genome, just tell you that the genome exists, tells you about its quality, tells you who did it, and really, really asks you to use those genomes in your research. So if there's a genome you want to sequence, contact us. If there's a genome that you see we are sequencing and you want to know where it is, have a look at some of our open data portals. And if there's a bunch of genomes there you want to work on, please do work on them. This is one of the latest ones we published. Um, it's a, a small butterfly, Scotch Argus, happens to come from a rewilding site in the south of Scotland and happens to be collected by uh, an amateur and uh, junior uh, entomologist. Um, Oscar now has his first, first author paper. We want all our data to be open and to be accessible to everybody. And so we've built a series of portals that give you access to the data. So that includes a, a summary portal, which tells you where everything is and where you can find the data. Our QC data on the raw sequence is available to you immediately. The ensemble data are publicly available. And our analysis toolkits, such as Blob Toolkit, have public uh, viewers. All our data are published openly in Welcome Open Research. And this global coordination system, GOAT, is also open access. So I think it's really important for our project that these data are available globally. While the Scotch Argus butterfly might be relatively limited in spread, many of the species we sequence are truly global. So the red squirrel is found from Ireland to Korea. The golden eagle flies all around the Northern Palearctic. The fact that we've sequenced these individual specimens from UK and Irish uh, samples uh, doesn't mean we should keep the genome. The genome is there for all of us to use. Okay, so I get to talk about this, but um, it takes a village of people to do this. And we couldn't have done it without our collaborators in the Darwin Tree of Life project, our collaborators across the Tree of Life teams at Sanger and the Sanger core facilities, especially the sequencing and informatics services. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about some work done by people in my faculty team using these genomes um, to uh, understand biology. This is an image of the first 500 genomes we sequenced. One of the things you'll notice from this around the outside, there are an awful lot of butterflies and moths. And um, this was partly because of an interest, but also because these are one of the few species that were relatively easy to catch during the coronavirus lockdown. Many lepidopterists were setting up moth traps in their back gardens during lockdown for their own sanity and also to help our project. So our project started with many, many moths and butterflies. So what can we do with these moths and butterflies? Well, they're, they're free cupcakes for everyone to eat. What can we do with them? So one of the things we're interested in is chromosomes. So we're generating chromosome level assemblies. What can this tell us about the evolution of chromosomes? We have 23 in, in humans. And uh, why 23? Why this 23 and why, to, why not another organization? And so we've been looking at the chromosomes of butterflies and moths. So we currently have about 188, slightly more now actually, um, uh, high quality chromosomal lepidopteran assemblies and there are another uh, 20 or so available in the public databases. And so we can co-analyze these together to ask about how do chromosomes evolve in Lepidoptera. So the excitement about Lepidoptera is not just because they're pretty, which they are, 
but also there are about 10% of all animal species. So 180,000 species on this planet are named species of Lepidoptera. So it's 180,000 out of 1.8 million. So understanding the chromosomes of Lepidoptera, we've actually understood the evolution of the chromosomes of a tenth of the world's species. Turns out Lepidoptera have a very um, a stereotypical chromosome number of 31. But some species have very different chromosome numbers, so ranging from 5 to 233. And this pattern of chromosome number variation is taxonomically uh, restricted. So some groups of species have all have um, different chromosome numbers, whereas other groups all have 31. So what controls chromosome number in Lepidoptera? One thing you should know is Lepidopteran chromosomes are holocentric, which means they have no defined centromere. And this, uh, to many, means that there's an expectation that Lepidopteran karyotype evolution can be very rapid. Because without a centromere, there's no single point um, of uh, attachment to the spindle, and therefore fusions and fissions should be much more tolerated. Given that most of them have 31, there must be also some constraint in there, because if most of them have 31, it means that there is some normative principle that's keeping them at 31. Okay, so the data I'm going to present is work by Charlotte Wright, a PhD student in my group, based on the DTOL and other butterfly genomes and moth genomes. Um, I'm only going to present data on the first 89 species, um, because the data for 200 plus is still ongoing. The stories for the 89 species is uh, borne out by the analyses on the 212. First of all, what about chromosome number and genome size? If you have more chromosomes, is your genome bigger? Are the organisms with more chromosomes polyploid, perhaps? And the answer is no. So you can have many, many, many chromosomes, the haploid chromosome number graph on the right there, and have a normal size genome. So most of the chromosome number change is to do with fission, and fusion of chromosomes and not polyploidy. When we compare any two moths or butterflies genomes at the chromosome level, we get patterns like this. So each of these little squares is a comparison of one Melitea chromosome with one Biston chromosome. So Biston's a moth, Melitea's a butterfly. And I hope you can see that these squares have little lines in them, and those lines indicate uh, collinearity between the genes on the two chromosomes, but also conservation of genes being on the same chromosome in these two different species. So the chromosomes are conserved and the order of the genes on the chromosome is conserved. The one on the bottom le uh, left there is the Z chromosome, the sex chromosome, and it has it does undergo more rearrangement. So if you do the comparison across all the Lepidoptera in our data set and use algorithmic approaches, we can define 31 ancestral elements, ancestral linkage group elements, which we're calling Marian elements after Maria uh, Sibylla Marian, who was a, an entomologist, a German entomologist in the 16 and 1700s. Um, and so these Marian elements have been conserved through evolution. And the Marian element is defined by the genes it contains. So if we take a butterfly such as Vanessa, and the fact that this graph is boringly gray is because all the chromosomes are made up of sets of genes which have traveled together since the last common ancestor of the Lepidoptera we've worked on. Okay. So this chromosome system is extraordinarily stable in some cases, despite the fact that with horocentric chromosomes, one might expect to, to be very, very variable and plastic. There are fusions and fissions, so it's not all conservation and constraint, but about half the species have retained 31 of these ancestral Marilyn elements exactly. There have been 128 fusion events and simple fission events in just two species. Um, most of the fusion events are actually limited to um, quite high up the tree. And if you look at which Marian elements are fusing with each other. It tends to be that it's, uh, one of the very small Marian elements is usually fusing with one of the bigger ones. But the Z chromosome is uh, more likely to be 
involved in fusions than any other chromosome. Okay, so what's really interesting are the groups on this tree where the chromosome number is really large or really small compared with 31, and where um, fusion and fission appears to be much more rampant. So just looking at uh, these taxa, again, the graphs show if they're gray, it just means it's nothing has changed since the last common ancestor of the Lepidoptera we've looked at. And if there's any color, it means that there's mixing of Merian elements. And so in the Lysenids, in Lysandra bilargus, in Lysandra corridon, what's happened is that the chromosomes have been split, have undergone many, many fissions, such they move from having what was probably a base level of n equals 24 with some fusions to Lysandra bilargus having 45 and Lysandra corridon having 89. So this means that something has happened in that lineage, which has allowed fission, after initial set of fusions, has allowed fission to dominate the evolution of chromosome number. In the Pierids, here with uh, Coleus crocius as the outgroup, which has got 31, uh, the Pierids, we've had reduction in chromosome number. That reduction hasn't been by simple fusion, however. That reduction has been by fusion and scission, by cutting up the chromosomes and pasting them together. But excitingly, even when they're pasted together, being cut and pasted, the syntony order, the gene order in the chromosomes has been maintained. So here's a, a closer view of, of the large white, um, and you can see that there are blocks of uh, genes in different colors, which indicate they come from different original ancestral Marian elements. And these blocks are scattered amongst the um, chromosomes. So co complex set of fusions and fissions. The other thing we can do with these data, um, which I'm, I don't have time to go into, is looking at the comparisons of orthologous chromosomes. Because we know what was Merian element one in all our species, we can start to ask, well, what is the special properties of Merian element one? What are the special properties of Merian, Merian element 31, which is the Z chromosome? So one of the things we noted was that the short chromosomes, so these are the ones with higher Merian numbers, so Merian's 28, 29, 30, 31, tended to have much higher repeat density, tended to have a very different GC content from the rest of the chromosomes. And within every species, and that's what's on this graph, each of the lines here is not Marian elements, but each line is a species. Within every species, there's a gradient of um, repeat density with chromosome length in the chromosomes. This tells us that this is a property of all lepidopteran chromosomes. And it's kind of interesting because the short chromosomes have a higher recombination rate per me megabase than do the long chromosomes. And this means that they should be more effectively purged of repeats than are the long chromosomes. But we see the opposite in that the average repeat density of the short chromosomes is high. The other thing this tells us is that this means that different genes, which are associated with Marian elements, have been exposed to different uh, evolutionary constraints just because of the chromosome they're on for millions of years. And this means these genes will have different evolutionary trajectories depending on the chromosome they're on. So not only will they have perhaps evolved cis-regulation and co-regulation with other genes on the same linkage group, but they may also have been exposed in general to very different patterns of evolutionary change. And we can see that whether it's GC, repeat, coding density, or uh, effective levels of, of retained synteny. So these reference genomes allow us to get something really very new. So we have 31 Marian, Marian elements in the base of the Lepidoptera analyzed here. Chromosome structure is strongly conserved. Fusions are more common than fissions, despite that the modal number is 31, which means that they're independent processes. Um, the fusion rate correlates with the repeat density, but also the chromosome length. And we've got three independent origins of extensive genome regulation, which allows will allow us to distinguish between the three processes that are going on. There's an abacus that counts usually to 31, but sometimes that is reset or eliminated. There's something that enables fusions. And there's something that generates fissions. It'd be really, I'm really excited, as is Charlotte, to try and work out what the biology and evolutionary implications of the interaction of these three processes is. Okay. So 
What I hope I've shown you is that from these new complete reference genomes, we can start asking new biological questions. And this is just a story about Lepidoptera, which happens to be 10% of the species on the planet, but there are equally exciting stories to be explored and equally exciting new mechanisms to be unveiled across all of life. Okay, so again, just to thank people, and especially this time, Charlotte, um, whose PhD work I've presented today.